The election to ensure only those who love China run Hong Kong. Pro-democracy activists complain that the first vote under China's controversial national security law further erodes freedoms. Beijing argues the outcome will restore stability. So what does it all mean for Hong Kong's future? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbara. It's designed to ensure only what China describes as patriots take their seats in Hong Kong's parliament. Voters in Hong Kong have cast their ballots in the first election since the national security law was imposed by China last year. Leaders in Beijing insist, just like the security legislation, changes to the election system are needed to ensure stability following mass protests. Demonstrators marched in their millions to condemn the erosion of democracy, which was guaranteed in the 1997 handover from British rule. So will the election herald a new era, or is it a recipe for yet more turmoil in one of Asia's landmark cities? We'll discuss all that with our panel in a moment. First, this report from Brit Clenet. Giant billboards all over Hong Kong, urging residents to vote in an election designed strictly for Chinese patriots. Security was tight as Hong Kong held its first poll since China's leaders in Beijing overhauled the electoral system. Those changes, they said, were to ensure only those who love China run Hong Kong. The new rules drastically limit the number of directly elected seats in Hong Kong's parliament. Four and a half million Hong Kong residents are eligible to vote for members of the Legislative Council, but their ballots will only decide 20 seats out of 90. The rest will be hand-picked by pro-Beijing committees. The leadership in Beijing says the new rules will clean up what it calls any anti-China elements and bring calm to the once lively legislature in the former British colony. There's rules and regulation everywhere if you are a citizen anywhere, so you have to obey the law. Taking an office is a basic thing. If you don't want, then don't play the game. That's it. With most pro-democracy figures out of the race, pro-Beijing politicians are forging ahead without an effective opposition. The question is, how many voters are turned off by this lack of choice? This 20-year-old student who asked Al Jazeera to conceal her identity said the lack of representation meant she won't be voting. The government and the election are not trustworthy to me now because they can um, disqualify whoever they dislike and um, rules can be changed uh, every second by the government to what they favor. So actually this is quite useless and meaningless. Uh, all 153 candidates in this election were selected. The priority is they had the concept of patriotism and love for Hong Kong. What they want is Hong Kong to be good. Early polling data suggested a lower turnout than previous years. But while casting her ballot, Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam reiterated that the turnout is not her focus. The government has not set any target for voter turnout rate. Right? Uh, not for this election, not for previous elections. Uh, because there is a combination of factors that will affect uh, the voter turnout rate in any election. But it does appear to be a delicate topic. The Hong Kong government threatened the Wall Street Journal over one of the newspaper's critical editorials in the lead-up to the election. And at least 10 people were arrested for inciting others to cast a blank ballot. Exiled leaders of the democracy movement called for everyone to boycott Sunday's election. Police responded by issuing warrants for their arrest. Brit Clenet, Al Jazeera, Hong Kong, for Inside Story. Let's take a closer look now at how we got to this particular point. In 2019, a proposed law which allowed the extradition of anyone in Hong Kong to mainland China sparked protests. That was later withdrawn, but millions continued to demand for reforms and more freedoms. In November 2019, pro-democracy candidates won a crushing victory local council elections in a vote that saw record turnout. But last year, China's leaders voted to impose national security legislation on the territory's right to free speech and political dissent. Since then, there's been a major crackdown with the arrest of many activists who have been jailed or fled overseas.
Let's bring in our guests from London. Nathan Law, a former politician in Hong Kong and pro-democracy activist in Hong Kong. Tom Grundy, editor-in-chief of Hong Kong Free Press and from Beijing. Andy Mox, senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization Think Tank. Thank you for joining us. Let me start with Nathan. This is quite a crucial moment for both Beijing, which sees this is going to pave the way for patriots to take over the destiny of Hong Kong and for the opposition, which seems to be pretty much concerned about the future. How do you see the outcome of this uh, election unfolding? Um, so for now, uh, the latest figure that we have is uh, three hours before the polling closes. Uh, is only 26.5% uh, of the voting rates. If you compare to the 2016 Legislative Council election, which it was 43.6, and to 2019, the local uh, uh, district council election, which was 63.7, uh, um, the difference is drastic. It really shows that people do not believe in this election, and they feel really strong um, to boycott it because there are just no... Um, true representative representative for them. Um, candidates are being vetted by political police mm -hmm. and in the name of uh, getting patriots into the election. But actually, the government just erased the voice that they don't like. Tom, when you look at the optics of this particular vote, why is it suddenly becoming about voter turnout? A bigger turnout is an indication that people are happy with Beijing. A lower turnout is a massive setback for the Chinese government. Well, certainly the government needs these polls to look credible. And you can see Chief Executive Carrie Lam just a week or two ago trying to get ahead of this situation by saying that a low turnout could also mean that people agree with the government and don't need to go and vote. But, you know, it's being described as the quiet election, a subdued election, uh, none of the colour, drama, carnival atmosphere we've seen uh, in previous polls in Hong Kong. Our team across the city today have basically seen a, a, a trickle of mostly senior uh, voters cast their ballot during these newly restricted polls. 10,000 police officers deployed, 9,000 anti-corruption officers. And certainly over recent weeks, it's been a struggle sometimes to understand what candidates' uh, policies are. A few don't even appear to have manifestos, let alone a social media presence. And uh, I think the only drama we've seen is one who uh, tried to campaign for a, a metro station in his constituency where there's been one for over three decades. One candidate even standing on a platform of no change. Um, so certainly the, uh, the, the results are perhaps already known in terms of there only being pro-Beijing and pro-establishment candidates. Uh, but the question really is uh, about the turnout now, which is certainly on track to be the lowest yet. Andy, despite the massive resources deployed by Beijing, there's a general sentiment that the pro-establishment candidates failed to win the hearts of minds of many people in Hong Kong who remain pretty much concerned about what happens next in, the, in, in Hong Kong. Well, I'm not sure I completely uh, agree with these assessments. Um, so I think, first of all, voter turnout, uh, the percentage of voter turnout, certainly is a very good statistic. Uh, but it's also a bit of a vanity metric as well. So, of course, if it's a high number, everyone feels good. It provides good talking point, a good talking point for the Hong Kong government. But again, I think as Tom alluded to, uh, people vote either because they're dissatisfied with the situation. And those that vote, certainly we know a handful at least, are unhappy with the system as it exists today in Hong Kong. But I would say just as many, if not many, many more, are mostly satisfied with the direction and are saying, why do I need to vote if uh, I don't feel like there needs to be any major changes? The other thing I would add to, to Tom's point is that there are candidates who have very clear positions. Uh, for example, uh, calling for an accelerated and greater integration with the Greater Bay Area, uh, allowing for greater talent mobility, because we know one of the sources for the protest mm -hmm. uh, was the uh, lack of opportunity uh, or the perceived lack of opportunity for young people in Hong Kong. And that is a problem that needs to be solved. And I think at least some of the people standing for office are rec have recognized this and plan to do something about it. 
Okay, Nathan, from 2019 all the way towards this particular vote, there's been a campaign to clamp down on dissent, which explains why people are sent into exile or jailed or pretty much just silenced. They're not really uh, willing to move forward and express their views. Do you think that the absence of a vocal, strong, vibrant opposition on the street is an indication that starting from tomorrow, Hong Kong won't be the same ever again? Well, it's clear that one of the major reasons why people marched down to the street, we've got more than two millions of them, more than a quarter of the population protest in 2019 was uh, the increasing um, erosion of freedom in Hong Kong and also um, just Beijing government turning Hong Kong into just an ordinary Chinese city and um, the Hong Kong we used to know are gone. So for now, it's really clear that people are not voting, not because of their satisfaction towards the government. It does not make sense because the government have been appealing people to go out and vote. The level of advertisement, the level of urgency to ask them to vote is unprecedented. We've never seen so many advertisements put out by the government to ask people to vote. If the government is really listening, uh, if the people is really listening to the government, then they would definitely do it because they know that the government needs the facade of Hong Kong having a successful election to prove that, oh, there is indeed an enhancement in our own system. But the reality is people do not agree with that. Uh, after 2019, we've seen the implementation of the national security law, the election overhaul, which makes our total election a direct election seat, mm -hmm. decreased from around half to less than a quarter and these are really signs of turning Hong Kong to an authoritarian city and mm -hmm. people use their feet to prove uh, to say that we we are fed up. We're not going to vote to lend any legitimacy to the government. So I think the assessment is clear. People do not agree with the direction of the city, do not agree with those authoritarian erosion of our, mm -hmm. of our system and they are not voting. But, Tom, don't you see that the debate about the outcome of the election becomes a, a moot point in the sense that since you have the legislation uh, uh, overhaul where the proportion of the legislators to be directly elected has been slashed from 53 all the way towards 22, and then the 40 out of the 90 uh, seats are of candidates who are definitely going to be screened more by a committee which is loyal to the establishment in Beijing. So by the end of the day, the outcome will definitely be what China expects to happen. Right. So the voting power of regular citizens has been halved. As you say, there are uh, 40 seats chosen by a pro-Beijing committee. And on top of that, you've got another 30 seats um, that are special interest groups, corporations, even foreign banks, some of them state owned that actually get a vote today whilst Hong Kongers are uh, becoming more uh, disenfranchised. And as much as there has been some suggestion that there may be some choice of candidates here, the fact is that all 153 have been vetted now uh, since this revamp uh, by several layers of pro-Beijing uh, committees, and each candidate has undergone a national security probe. Um, now, despite what Mr. Mock said about those who have abstained from voting today, uh, all of those we've spoken to have said because, you know, the, the Democrats they usually vote for, and some, this is the first election they've not voted in, are just not here. Um, most pro-democracy figures are behind bars on remand. Uh, they're in self-exile abroad, uh, like Nathan. Uh, they are barred from running in this election, or they've quit politics altogether. Mm -hmm. Andy, uh, the uh, chief executive, Carrie Lam, and the pro-establishment candidates are saying basically that the fundamental about this election is the fact that it restores stability back to Hong Kong. This slogan, that stability, is a top priority. Do you think that this is something you can easily sell to the people of Hong Kong? I think it can be easily sold to the people of Hong Kong. So I think one of the hallmarks of Hong Kongers is pragmatism. And I want to go back here that, believe it or not, I actually... Uh, agree with Nathan in that I think the Hong Kong government is uh, perhaps obsessing a bit with this uh, election participation rate. Mm -hmm. And again, I think of it as a vanity metric. So if you're running an internet business, you love to see certain numbers. They sound great, but do they really matter? And first of all, I want to say, let's look at these protests. Again, I think some of the 
causes, the root causes are very legitimate. But if we look around the world, what have protests delivered from the color revolutions to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement in the United States? Now, of course, it called attention to some problems, but on overall, I think they've been more destructive than positive. So the question here we have to ask ourselves mm -hmm. is, why do we even have government in the first place versus a state of anarchy where everyone relies on self-help? Well, we give government the monopoly on violence because it can deliver better lives for the mm -hmm. citizens of that particular country. So I think that this really is the metric that matters. And while governments, especially Hong Kong, because I think the, uh, the Hong Kong administration wants in a way to have it both ways. It wants the real prosperity and stability for Hong Kong to be a part of uh, P the PRC, but it also wants uh, the recognition and the praise from the West as well. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the obsession perhaps with voter turnout is understandable mm -hmm. uh, and it'd be great if they can get it, but 25% is not a bad number. And I think other metrics matter more. Nathan, uh, how do you see those Democrats, pro-democracy candidates who said, you know what, we think there is an opening here, a wiggle room for maneuvering by joining these elections, because if we get elected, we will fight for the rights of people to be freed, for people such as yourself to be allowed back into their homes with dignity. How do you see that justification? Well, the simple answer is you can never do it because um, the government now is just using all their resources to crack down all the decent boys. Even they get into legislation, they are unable to speak up as strong as before. And for now, even if there are few of them getting into the council, we're talking about a few out of 90 legislators in total. Um, this is a rubber stamp chamber, as we all know. And uh, protests in 2019, they are not looking for anarchy. They are not, not looking for disbandment of the government. They're looking for Beijing to keep their promises, which they gave Hong Kong people in 1997, uh, about autonomy, democracy, and freedom. And I think even though you can have different opinion towards what the protest, uh, what, what their effects are, but in, in its essence, Hong Kong people are seeking for the system that can represent them, mm -hmm. that a government that are elected by them. And these are fundamentals of, uh, 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 of the one country, two system. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it's clear that um, the government, the Hong, Hong Kong and Chinese government now is seeking um, a high turnout rate to lend a legitimacy to its election reform, to its implementation of the national security law. And the Hong Kong citizens, their stance are very clear they're not falling into that line. So if we compare to the final turnout rate, which we still don't have it one yet, but we will assume mm -hmm. or we'll roughly predict that it were around 30% of it. If you compare to 2019 uh, turnout rate, which eventually it was 71%, it's much less than half of the people who voted in 2019 came out um, today. And it sends a really strong signal. It is a meaningful indicator and it is a passive resistance of the uh, of the Hong Kong people saying that we're not aligning to your so-called enhancement narrative. Hong Kong is not looking good and you're just turning Hong Kong into uh, another ordinary Chinese city. Mm -hmm. Tom, we might spend quite some time talking about the metrics here, comparing the voter turnout to 2019, 2016, 2002, 2000, uh, 2000, sorry. But ultimately, tomorrow when the people of Hong Kong will wake up to the outcome of the elections. Don't you see that the fundamental element here is that all those hopes about universal suffrage elections that are vibrant following the 1997 uh, handover uh, from the British rule are forever shattered and that people in Hong Kong will have to forget about those dreams and move forward with a system which is modeled around the Chinese system. Well, yes, I mean, with most pro-democracy figures behind bars, it is difficult to imagine the likes of the umbrella movement in 2014 or the unrest in 2019 uh, happening again. Um, over 50 civil society groups, including decades-old unions and those that organized the huge July 1st democracy marches or the Tiananmen Square um, vigils, have been disbanded. And on this matter of turnout, I mean, 
uh, I agree with Mr. Mock somewhat that the, the government have really gone to town with uh, emphasizing this and huge spending, as Nathan said, on uh, banners everywhere trying to get the vote out. And some of these incentives that have, have been put on today, um, COVID tracing apps we're used to using here have been suspended uh, in polling stations, special queues for the elderly, border zone stations so people can nip over the border if they're eligible um, from China to vote. Um, even some set up in quarantine centers. And one thing they've been doing that appears to have backfired somewhat is free travel and transport on buses, uh, on trams, uh, on the metro. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those we spoke to today um, were off hiking or shopping. Um, and already you're seeing the blame game begin now with some candidates blaming that free transport scheme or what they see as a lack of promotion um, for the, this turnout situation that's destined to be the lowest yet. Mm -hmm. Andy, I was going to ask you a question about what's next for China, because it seems that after they introduced the security reform, after they introduced the election uh, reform, they're still struggling with selling the election to the international community, to the point where the chief executive, Carrie Lam, was, was basically saying, you know what, if tomorrow people decide not to vote in large numbers, you should just take it as a positive signal, because in genuine democracies, people, when they are happy with the government, there is a voter apathy. That does not really sink in with the rationale because people say, you know what, people don't seem to buy into the rhetoric and the narrative of the Chinese government. Well, I think, you know, the, the challenge that uh, the Hong Kong government faces in wanting uh, recognition uh, from the West is to a degree also something that China would like as well. So I think there is uh, an interest in the elections uh, in Hong Kong going well and being seen as going well. Mm -hmm. But I wanna go back to a point that Nathan made about turning Hong Kong into just another Chinese city. So Shenzhen is a Chinese city. In the 40, past 40 years, it's per capita GDP increased 10,000 times. So that means if you were making $10,000 a year, you'd now be making $100 million a year. Um, now, of course, there's much more to life than just economics, but that doesn't sound so bad to become just another Hong Kong city. The other point I want to respond to that Nathan made was that uh, he feels that, uh, that Hong Kongers are losing uh, the right of representation. Mm -hmm. But let's look at the numbers. Uh, LegCo is going from 70 to 90 seats. That's an increase. And also, we need to ask an even more basic question. Why do people need to be represented? It's because, again, so their government can deliver the goods that they need yeah. for a prosperous, stable, and safe life. Mm -hmm. So if the government is doing this through a single party system or even a monarchy, mm -hmm. and the people were happy, um, why do you need opposition voices. And again, I mean, this is quite I've been trying, I've been trying to, to say, but I'm just posing to listen to your narrative. But just, just to, uh, Andy, I mean, but still, by the end of the day, we, we, we're talking about people who have been silenced, sent to jail, people who have been sent into exile. And these people are basically saying, if you if you if you're saying is is right, then why is the government not allowing these people just to express their views? You know that in a place like Hong Kong, if you tell people not to vote in the elections, you risk to spend some time behind bars. Let me go to Nathan for this question. Nathan, at the same time, when you're talking about those concerns, you know that the international community has lost leverage when it comes to China. For someone like yourself, for the thousands of people who have been disillusioned, who have been evicted, who have been sent behind bars, who have lost the right to express their views, we have to be at the same time practical and realistic. The opposition is divided than ever. What's your roadmap for the future? Well, Mr. Moore has been confusing a lot of different contexts. Uh, when we're talking about Hong Kong turning into just an ordinary Chinese city, we're talking about its political system, which uh, the difference of Hong Kong's political system compared to the Chinese one is guaranteed under the one country, two system principle, which China has signed the international treaty to deliver it. And if you are talking about fine, um, it is the way to go. Then you are saying that China violates international treaty is fine as long as they want to do so. I think this is not the best narrative to support China's agenda. And if you're talking about the election, well, the increase of the seats does not matter because all these seats are going to the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party. You've got much more um, appointed seats, basically, than popular contested seats 
and we've only got 20 out of Thank 90 you. compared to 35 out of 70. These are just not um, an improvement. If we're talking Thank about the opposition camp for now, I don't think we're Thank divided. You. I think we Nathan, were definitely united. To, unfortunately, to, to, to we have to leave it. it there. We'll definitely revisit the issue of Hong Kong in the near future. Nathan, Lord, Tom, Grandy and Andy Mock, I really appreciate your insight and looking forward to talking to you in the near future. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Insight Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Insight Story. From me, Hashim Ahbala and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.